a heart after God, how a shepherd boy became king and a servant. Um, today I want to focus on how God develops us. The, we're reading at the moment the uh, uh, 2 Samuel, I think um, we're up to what, chapter 14, uh, 17. Oh, whatever. Anyway, I'm a bit behind. And uh, one, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel gives us the story of King David. When I became a Christian and started reading uh, the Bible, obviously, uh, I'm reading the Chronicles account, the first and second Chronicles, the story of David. It was really good because it was just all the good points about David. And the chronicler, whoever it was, we think it might have been Ezra the, the scribe, he just talks about the good things of David and the glories of his kingdom and, and the influence around the world and for eternity. Then you read 1 and 2 Samuel, and he also gives you the good part of David, but man, does he tell you some of his mistakes and some of the gory details. In fact, when you read it, you get a bit embarrassed and say, oh, that should be censored. Why did you include that? So God's given us a complete picture of David. The good, the bad, the ugly. And uh, I'm focusing the last couple of Sundays and today just on the young David, the boy shepherd, as he's been called to be the king. And, uh, and just before he's crowned as king, from a teenager from 16 years of age to about 30 years of age. And uh, his story has so many lessons. Um, and so, you know, from the moment that David stepped out publicly where we first see him as a public personality he does an extraordinary thing he faces Goliath and he kills him this giant that was terrifying the armies of Israel and his life changed forever after that in an instant this teenager was catapulted from a nobody to a national hero David's victory over Goliath stands out as one of the high watermarks of his of his life and many people think that this inaugurated his reign and think, oh, well, now he's going to become king. Hey, it's about 14 years later. Um, and it was not smooth sailing from now on. It was a difficult time for him. This young teenage kid, till he was crowned, went through hell and back. He went through a time of suffering and trial that kind of defies imagination. You read it and think, man, how many bad things can happen to such a good person? How many rotten things? You know, not just one, two, three, but it just kept on following him. And while the giant killing was David's greatest achievement up to this time, it actually swept him out to sea and he was adrift. And it caused a lot of problems, but it heralded a massive testing time. And, and through the events that followed Goliath's death, Dave, David was molded by God into the man that God wanted for the throne. And he used all the circumstances of David's life, both the good and the bad, as tools to sculpture him into the person who could fulfill his unique purpose. It's like um, Michelangelo when he did the, the, the sculpture of David. Initially, it was this massive, probably 30-foot slab of marble. Two other great sculptors tried to to, to do it and they gave up and they said oh that marble's flawed and Michelangelo is a young guy he saw it you know what he saw he saw David in all his glory he saw it and all he did for the next how many years was he chipped away all the rubbish until this magnificent picture of of David that's in the Florence Museum and uh, there's a lot of stuff that had to be chipped away before you could see the magnificence of of this man and this is what God did in David's life and that's what he does with us uh, he chips away and he uses anything and everything to cause good to occur to us even though the things that are happening to us may not be good and so through the example of David's life we learn how God develops us for his unique purposes so firstly I see here by learning patience anyone here has got the patient stakes under control you are perfectly patient under any circumstance and every circumstance. You've just got it together. Mrs. Patience, anyone here? Don't put your hand up because we will not agree with you. He learned patience through submitting to God. Immediately after killing Goliath, Saul enlists him into his army. 
and he eventually promotes him to command a regiment of the army and in fact Saul liked him. It says in, in 1 Samuel, David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul liked him very much and David became one of his armor bearers, personal assistant, personal protector, part of the Praetorian Guard, secret service, you know. Uh, then Saul sent word to Jesse, David's dad, saying, allow David to remain in my service for I am pleased with him. So throughout this learning patience time, let's call it that, David displayed unquestioning obedience to Saul and he performed all of his duties faithfully and loyally. David didn't brag that he was to be the new king, you know, the young kid going, man, you know, where this old boy bites the dust, I'm, it's my chance to take over. He didn't poke any disloyal jabs, he didn't take any presumptuous liberties, he didn't make any attempt to out-king Saul. Amazingly, after slinging that triumphant stone that knocked out that evil giant, David clung on to his humility and he constantly exhibits a beautiful submission, a submissive attitude towards King Saul. And this continued even when Saul didn't deserve it. And the picture of Saul, after David has been called to be king before David becomes inaugurated, is a picture of a man in decline. And you don't like him. In fact, the sooner he bites the dust, the better for everyone. Because he degenerates into this malevolent being that causes a lot of grief to a lot of people, including David. And David's submission to Saul is a powerful example for us not to push our way up life's ladder, but to leave the lifting to God instead. And I know um, in my early years, just before I was called in to lead the Christian Family Center, a small little church that had started a couple of years earlier that I was involved in being a guest speaker, suddenly the founder of our movement, who I was being trained under, Leo Harris, died suddenly, 57 years of age, four years younger than me. Amazing. Fit as can be, just dies. Does his run, drives his car into his carport, turns the ignition off, gone. Straight to be with the Lord. Well, it catapulted the church and the movement into, a, into, into incredible convulsions. In fact, as brilliant a leader as he was, an inspirational leader, there was no proper succession plan. There was no proper development strategy of, of who takes what responsibility. Everyone was loyal to him because he was such a, a beautiful man and an inspirational leader. But practical management, well, that was something else. So the church went downhill terribly. What was heaven on earth for us for a period of time at times became hell on earth as different competing parties split the church, wanting their man to be the new pastor, the new leader. And uh, Hans Vortman and I, we grew up together, Kathy, Hans, myself, were all around the same age and we were teenagers there and then in our young adults. And I know that Hans and I were so disturbed and David Hersey as well, David, who's one of our dear friends and, um, and one of our board of elders. And so we all, we all spoke up in the right time, who we felt should be the right leader. And I think we were right, but speaking for myself, I think I had some attitudes that were wrong. And the way that I did it was a very Greek way in those days, you know, when you're 22, 23. And so I spoke to some of the elders and I gave my opinion of what I felt. And look, some of them didn't receive it too well. And, <laughs> um, but, uh, but I remember dear Bruce Rofe, who was one of the elders, and uh, he received it so well. And he commended me and encouraged me. And I've never forgotten that. Pat, are you here today? And uh, yeah, and like he, he was just such a man of God. But we went through a difficult time, Hans and I. And in some respects, some things were said about us. And there was hurt and upset. And we had to come to a place where we submitted ourselves to our leaders. They were the constituted authority. And... Uh, <laughs> Some things were happening that weren't right. We had to respond to God and we had to submit our hearts. And I remember saying to the, the bunch of the, the elders of our mouth, I said, I'm never going to talk about this again. I've shared my opinion and I think this is the right course of action. It's obvious who we think should be the leader and let's, let's make this. I said, but that's it. I, I don't want to be involved in party politics and I've shared my opinion, that's it. Well, it didn't go down too well and we had to submit 
connect uh, ourselves to God. Anyway, the Lord opened the door for Hans to go into ministry in, in Victoria and for me at the family centre. You know, ironically, Hans and I now lead that very denomination. Hans in South Australia and myself nationally. Isn't that amazing? Here are two young, young guys, a strong Dutchman and a stronger Greek man. And we shared our opinions. But you have to learn submission. And, and, and even when you disagree, that you've got to let God do the lifting. And uh, not that we were looking for positions like that, but it's amazing how God has honoured us. And, uh, and I think of um, David Hersey's role, and uh, he went through difficulties, great misunderstandings. And David became one of our elders here, being in the longest serving elder now, probably uh, overseeing our churches and a great pillar in the church here and supporter of us. So David learned this. Jesus is the best example, I reckon, on humility and submission and the benefits it's brought to the whole world ever since. You should be so thankful Jesus, the strongest man that ever lived, God in human form, the click of his fingers, he could have commissioned 80,000 angels to wipe out the Roman Empire. He learned submission, humbled himself, a mission from the Father, not to conquer the world by physical force, but to conquer the world and the hearts of men by the power of his love. And that's what Laura sang about, that amazing love that disarms us. And he humbled himself, he submitted himself to God's, the Father's will, even when he was facing the, a terrible death and he even prayed, God, take it from me. And he brought salvation. Look at Hebrews 5.7 the benefits for us. Because during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears, upset deeply to the one who could save him from death. And he even sweated blood, his capillaries busted and there was blood and stuff coming out because he was under such terrible stress in that garden of Gethsemane as he's heading towards his death on a cross. He didn't fear physical death. It was the separation from his relationship with his Father. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for eternity were one, one God, three persons. The Son, because of the Father's will, came to earth and became Jesus of Nazareth. And now there was going to be separation. He had to trust the Father at a profound level. And his humanity was, will he raise me up from the dead? Is this going to work? He was also fully man. And so he struggled. He really struggled, and Jesus' submissive obedience to God's will purchased your salvation. If he didn't do that, you could not be saved. Your sins could not be forgiven. You could not have the gift of eternal life. You wouldn't have any assurance that you're going to heaven when you die because of what he did on a cross for us. He had to submit to the Father's will to do this. Jesus' mother, look at her words in her worship psalm when she found out she was pregnant with God that God was actually in her womb, supernaturally. She was going to birth the Son of God. She freaks out, as we know the story. And then she, she writes, or she sings this amazing song, and, and one of the refrains is, He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. Isn't that great? Folks, humility is in our best interest. Peter the proud, oh, how proud he was, Jesus' top disciple. He learned this lesson the hard way. It says this, Peter says this, God opposes the proud. He doesn't hate the proud, he opposes the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. So if you're proud and arrogant and conceited and not submitted and, and loyal and that, you're not going to get God's blessings flowing in your life. Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Wow. So what should our attitude be to our pastors and our ministry leaders and the governing eldership board of our church? I mean, I saw it last night with Lachlan and Adrian as our, two of our younger pastors, newer pastors, and, and how these, these guys and girls are submitted to them as they're, as they're leading them. And uh, there's blessing there. Look what the Scripture says. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. And, uh, and I'm, I'm so thankful for the, the, the way that this church and our leadership 
uh, over the years has, has operated where we haven't had to enforce our authority because the moment you try and enforce it, you kind of lose it. It has to be something that people say, yes, lead us. And that's a credit, I think, to the submissiveness and obedience and the humility of the people of the Christian family. So I'm bowled over by that. And, but the scripture says it's a principle. We learn it from King David. We learn it from Jesus. To be exalted requires only one thing of us, that we humble ourselves before God and respect his plan and submit to his timing in all things. Now, God, being fully aware of the rough waters that David was about to sail in, I mean, he's going to go through it, he gives him an intimate friend who helps him from time to time. Beautiful. His name is Jonathan. He's the king's son, he's Saul's son. He's, he's the heir to the throne. Jonathan was several years older than David, and he was also a mighty warrior. You can read that in 1 Samuel 14. But he was, and he was loved by the people. And he would have made a great king. I think Jonathan would have been a magnificent king. Yet he loyally submits to David as God's choice. He's younger than him, and he becomes his best friend and greatest supporter. You see, God develops us. Secondly here, as we grow in responsibility, and that comes through close and accountable friendships and relationships. It says in 1 Samuel 18, after David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. And Jonathan made a covenant. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing, gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword and his bow and his belt. And Jonathan said to David, go in peace, for we have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord. When Jonathan gave David his robe and his armor, you know what he was saying? In effect, he was transferring his own status as heir apparent to David. And King Saul, his dad, because of his all-consuming jealousy of David, a hateful jealousy, sets in motion several schemes to try and murder this young David. And Jonathan courageously defends his friend. Jonathan remained loyal to his father, the king, but only to a point. And when Saul crossed the line, when his dad crossed the line and threatened his friend David, Jonathan was very quick to make a stand. And his example teaches us that a true friend, and if you have a true friend, a real friend, that friend will never be two-faced. And that friend will always defend you out of love and loyalty. That friend will always speak the truth in love. And that's what David had. And to grow how God develops us, we can't be islands on our own. The more isolated that we are, the more dangerous that is. And we know that. The more isolated, the more independent, the more separated people become, so does ill health, emotional, relational, mental ill health. Whereas people who are integrated and connected with other people and allow those people to speak into their lives and they've got some bosom buddies, some, some friends like a Jonathan who can speak the truth and will always keep their confidence and love them through to the end when they're facing difficult times. I don't know how David would have made it if he didn't have, Don, uh, didn't have uh, uh, Jonathan there. And so we see this. In 1 Samuel 20, 41, he is after one of the schemes, one of the schemes of, of Saul. I mean, you've got to, when you read the story, you realize Saul was scheming to kill David in so many different ways. So there's another scheme. And Jonathan finds out the scheme and he protects David. And there's the story here, a little boy that, that Jonathan used to, to be like a go-between and a messenger. And in 1 Samuel 20, it says this. And after the boy had gone, David got up from the south side of the stone and he bowed down before Jonathan three times because his life was safe. It was an assassination plot. He was going to be killed with his face to the ground, and then they kissed each other and wept together. But David wept the most. What a poignant, heart-moving scene that is. Then they kissed each other and wept together, but David wept the most. See, when your heart is bruised, an intimate friend will let you weep freely and transparently. And men, some of you men need to weep. You say, well, I'm not a crybaby. I don't know what happens when you turn, I think when you probably hit the mid-50s, but, you know, like I'm 61 now, 
I cry like a baby now. I don't know what's going on. Is that right, fellas? Do you, as we get older, do we cry more? Some of the guys saying, you're weird, Bill. <laughs> if Jesus wept. He wept freely. If David wept, tears of gratitude, openness to somebody who's not going to despise that, doesn't see weakness but sees humanity and sees a heart, that is so, so important. I think we've, I mean, the whole of Australia has felt so deeply for the previous Prime Minister this week. The magnificence of how he has handled this. But the, the, the pain, you know, is, is so, so deep. And everyone now is saying, man, he's a beautiful man. He's just a loyal man. He will never do a Kevin Rudd and, and destroy the very party or the next Prime Minister. And they were coming out saying, I, think, I wish all that stuff came out in the open beforehand. What a nice person he is. Even though the public persona kind of life is difficult on television. I thought, wow, interesting. So I'm sure there's many tears that have been shed. And you can open your heart goes out, you think, man, where there's been great ambition and and, and, a, and a credible dream for that to be dashed without you having any notice, without you knowing it. Oh, the devastation. So pray for him and pray for the new PM that he will succeed for the good of the country. So here you need the bosom buddy. So how does God develop us? By learning patience through submission to God, by growing in responsibility through close and accountable uh, relationships. And it says here, look at this other scripture, it's beautiful. And Saul's son, Jonathan, went to David at Horish. It's another story, another situation where his dad was trying to kill him. And he helped him find strength in God. Don't be afraid, he said, David. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel and I will be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this deep down. The two of them made a covenant before the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? Sometimes you can't get the help from God unless there's somebody walking with you, helping you to receive the encouragement from God. If you think, well, it's just God and me. I don't need anyone. Big mistake. Even Jesus himself. He needed close friends in his difficult times. He needed their presence and their personal support. Look at Matthew 26. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. Then he said, but Peter, James and John, come with me, you guys. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He's saying, I can't handle this. It's just too difficult. It's so, so hard. He even prays to the Father. He says, if it's possible, take this cup from me. I don't know how I can handle it. Sad thing is, he says, stay here and keep watch with me. In other words, just look after me. And he comes back and they're snoring their heads off. Oh. And, he says, and, he, and he's, his frustration is, guys, couldn't you even for one hour be with me? The loneliness, the sense of desperation as he knows he's going to be arrested and tortured and abused and ultimately murdered to outwork God's plan of salvation. So, folks, New Testament Christianity is all about being connected relationally with other believers. The vertical, my relationship with Jesus must find expression on a horizontal level. And that's why it's so important. That's why we keep saying, and I'll say it again to you, you need to be in a small group. You need to get involved in a connect group or some service group where you've got five, six, 10, 12 people around about you that know you. That you're not just an, a person who attends a large church, but you're involved in a group. They know you, they love you. You can share your heart, they can pray for you. Things go wrong, they can visit you in hospital. They, you know you've got the support and the strength. We all need that. We all need it. You know, as a pastoral team, the leadership team of the church, we meet every week. 
And we have agenda items and that, but look, I reckon half the time is fellowship and sharing and prayer. Praying for you guys, yeah, we say, let's pray for this situation and, and uh, let's pray for that little baby that's in hospital, you know, we're praying, let's pray for this person. But then we just talk and share and laugh and, and sometimes painful things that are happening where we need support and encouragement. I think it's great. I'd hate to say, well, let's go into the meeting. There are four items on the agenda. One, two, three, four, 15 minutes, dispatch the business of running the church. Let's go. That's just not real life. We need each other. And sometimes our meetings go too long. And we can't, but I think no team member should say anything at this moment. <laughs> but it's the fellowship and the sharing and the support and doing life together. I need it, and I'm a pretty strong minded person and have been around for a long time. If I need that support, you need it. Don't face life on your own. Where's your Jonathan? Get into a group. Have prayer, people praying for you. It could be a connect group. It could be some ministry group, service group. Don't do life on your own, just you and Jesus and, and be unknown. Get involved. Get connected with good people. Thirdly, how does God develop us? By handling the pitfall of popularity that comes, and that comes through humility and wisdom. Oh, the pitfall of popularity. See, in the eyes of the people, David was a star. In fact, he was a superstar. The people delighted in his leadership and loved the fact that he had made a giant leap from raw recruit to company commander. The women, fellas, be careful of the girls. Girls, be careful of the fellas when they give you too much attention and they're not your spouse. Close the door. Don't be flattered. Whether you're at work and you're achieving and successful, or whether you're in the church or elsewhere where you're succeeding and, and you're kind of growing in your gifts and God's using you. And um, you know where most adultery happens? Most adultery happens between people who work together. Very rarely with strangers work and you've left home and you've left a wife with three kids fellas and she doesn't look the best in the morning she's working hard then you go into an environment and she looks fantastic she smells good she looks good she works there how many men get blinded by it and before you know it he's with the secretary and he's ended his marriage Or close friendships, people that husbands and wives together, they're close, but they cross boundaries. And there's familiarities, there's little flirtations, there's little things like that. <sighs> Danger signs. Danger signs. Popularity. Attractiveness. And, uh, you know, God develops us as we handle the pitfall of popularity that comes through humility and wisdom. Let me tell you a story. True story in the early years. A woman came to the church, very needy, and, uh, you know, we blessed her. We gave her financial support. Kath and I, we just, you learned some lessons. We shouldn't have put a lot of money in, but we did anyway. So, but uh, something wasn't right. Yeah, four o'clock in the morning, she rings me up. I'm the only pastor. And the devils attacked her. It's like, Pastor Bill, I'm having a demonic attack. Please come and rescue me. So I'm thinking, hmm, I think I'll take my wife with me. In fact, when I, when I would visit women, I would take Mrs. Uh, Thompson during the day, and she'd be there in the kitchen while I'd be talking to somebody. I would never go on my own. And so I took Kath with me. So I knock on the door, and she didn't know. I knock on the door, and she opened the door, and she had almost nothing on. As soon as she saw my wife, she quickly went back in and robed herself. And uh, you realize, wow. So she was kind of attracted to the pastor who's popular and upfront and all that kind of stuff. But man, there, there are pitfalls to popularity. If you're at work, in your neighborhood, wherever you are, 
One has to be careful that you don't actually believe the propaganda that your own heart may actually be saying about you because you know who you are. You're a man, you're a woman. You're a sinful person saved by the grace of God. So in the eyes of the people, David was a superstar and they d delighted in his leadership. And they danced. Look at this, 1 Samuel 8, 7. And they danced and they sang, Saul has slain his thousand and David his tens of thousands. So these young girls were going around singing, yeah, David's the best and David's the best and Saul's okay, but David, oh, we love David. I mean, that does something to your head. How would David handle this sudden success? Most people lose their sense of balance and perspective in, in the, the thin air of their rapid rise to the top. In the sporting arena, I've talked to Margaret Court, world's greatest tennis player ever, men or women. Story she tells me of what used to happen in those rare heights within the tennis world, the immorality, the temptations, the adulation, the feigning, the, 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 the things that could go wrong. And she's so thankful she got saved and and uh, married well, but, uh, you know, like, like, wow. And it's true in those areas of life, politics, church, sport, business. How would David handle it? He had a level head. You know, let's read verse 22. He maintained his humility. He says, they, they repeated these words to David, but David said, do you think it's a small matter to become the king's son-in-law? Because he's actually got a, a wife and this is a king's daughter. So he gives him his daughter to marry. There wasn't much love in it. It was like just, I'm only a poor man and I'm little known. How's that? He knew himself. Jesus often shunned the limelight. Like Paul, well, like, like David. He really practiced humility and was so wise in this matter. The Lord himself, look at Luke 5. Then Jesus ordered him, don't tell anyone, a guy that was healed. Don't tell anyone, don't advertise it. But go show yourself to the priest and offer sacrifices. Yet the news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Jesus warned us about seeking the approval of the world and the pursuit of popularity and desiring celebrity status. He says, woe to you, Luke 6, when all men speak well of you, for that is how their fathers treated the false prophets. Woe to you when all men speak well of you. What I don't get with the transition from 1 p.m. to the other p.m. is within 24 hours, the next poll shows the coalition government is now one point ahead of the opposition, and for like 30 polls, they were 10 points behind. Uh, what is that? It's the popularity, it's the media game, it's the adulation of a person. Remember Kevin Rudd, loved by the media, so popular. Now Mr. Turnbull, loved. I trust he succeeds. But there's something scary about that, isn't it? Where the popularity is the main game rather than character and inner knowledge of a person. How they look, how they speak is more important than really the, the character of the life on the inside. And I say that, trusting that he will succeed as, as, our, as our new PM and, and really help the country enormously, but it's a bit of a worrying sign, the popularity trap. So Jesus says, be careful about that. Be really careful. Finally, how does God develop us? Learning patience through submission to him growing in responsibility through close and accountable friendships, handling the pitfall of popularity through humility and wisdom. Be careful, no tickets on yourself, know where you've come from, as David said. Jesus says, be careful. Then, by facing up to, the, uh, to unjust opposition through strong faith in God. If you're going to go forward in God, you will have opposition. There will be difficulties. And um, David's rising star ignited the brooding and depressed King Saul's paranoia. And you can see the fall of Saul. It's a terrible story. You read it from 1 Samuel 15 onwards, how Saul degenerated. 
and uh, the women's song of praise, though not intended to demean Saul, sparked a murderous blaze in Saul's life. It says in 1 Samuel 18, he was, Saul was very angry, and this refrain galled him. They've credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. You see, David had done nothing to deserve Saul's wrath. Yet at the, very, yet at the hand of the very king that David saved, he would be catapulted headlong into a terrible period of mistreatment, discouragement, and great personal pain. And it just didn't seem fair. And it doesn't seem fair when you read the story. But neither do most of the trials that you and I have to endure on the road to spiritual maturity. If you grow spiritually, and if you're moving forward in God, you will face trials and the misunderstandings of people. And uh, David uh, wrote this wonderful psalm. We've read one psalm already today. Let's read another one. Psalm 27 is a terrific example of how David's strong faith in God preserved him in his times of trouble. And it's one of my favorite psalms. I've almost memorized it. It's a wonderful psalm. A psalm of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Wow. Unjust opposition that can come your way. When we look at Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane prior to his arrest, we discover the deepest kind of faith that we can have in God. You know, he says, God, I can't do it. I can't do it. Take it away. And then he utters those words, but not my will, but your will. You see, surrendering to God's sovereign will, even when we desire to do the opposite, that's the deepest kind of faith. Particularly when you're facing opposition. It requires strong faith in God. The Apostle Paul, he discovered the great strength and power that comes through surrendering to God in times of great weakness and personal suffering. He says this, God spoke to him and says, Son, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Wow. So as a leader, as a Christian, as someone who serves Christ, you go forward in him and you're going to arouse some devils that will oppose you. And it'll be unjust. It'll be unfair. If you develop as a home group leader, you develop as a, as a youth leader, <laughs> You develop, I remember when Tim first became the, uh, the youth pastor here, his first week, the first week as Pastor Jeremy is leaving for Papua New Guinea as a missionary, we had to ask two of our young leaders to leave the church and report them to the authorities for mucking around with underage girls. They wouldn't submit. They wouldn't take it on board. 22-year-olds mucking around with 14-year-olds. We reported them to the cops, the authorities. One of them could not, no longer be a teacher. I remember Tim going, man, this is what being a youth pastor is like. You kick people out the church. And we had to have meetings with families and members and like, some things have happened are just awful. I'm heading up to our national conference of the CRC and I should be ready for this. And just like two weeks ago, I get a fiery dark like a most unreasonable, irrational, emotive letter from somebody who knows should know better. 
It's like, and I started upsetting me. And I realized, ooh, okay. Heading for spiritual blessing. National conference, our pastors and leaders. Okay, I'm going to handle this. So, so you, you just got to be careful. You go forward in God. You start moving forward and you're going to find some opposition from somebody. How the enemy will work and try and test you. Hey, Paul says here, that God says, my grace is sufficient for you. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. Jesus surrendered to God's sovereign will. Paul surrendered to God's sovereign will. David surrendered. He faced up to unjust opposition through strong faith in God. 